there everyone, Sarah Brown Wessling here. I am a high school English teacher just outside of Des Moines, Iowa at Johnston High School. And I'm also the 2010 National Teacher of the Year. But more than anything, um, I'm just really excited to be part of your experience and to be able to share with you some of the things that I've been thinking about and working through in this just weird time. And it is a weird time, isn't it? It's just, it's just crazy. I feel like, well, I feel like in general, really good things or really bad things illuminate what's already there. And so we're seeing a lot of what was already there um, in our systems and in our classrooms and, you know, in our teaching practice. Um, I think we are getting, uh, you know, just some beautiful spotlights on some of the, the great work. And I think we're getting some pretty, you know, glaring lights on the big questions we have to ask and some of the compelling work we need to do really differently. And I'm welcoming all of this, um, but I am welcoming it all um, and excited for the ways it's going to change me, but I'm still missing some things. I am missing my students. Um, I have missed watching their in-person aha moments. I have missed the celebratory rites of passage, um, you know, in, in the forms and the traditions that I'm used to. And probably like you, this time has caused you to miss things in your personal lives as well. It's happened to me, right? I've, I've missed my family and friends. I've missed kind of like the nonchalance of just grabbing dinner somewhere. I've missed um, going to uh, our favorite swimming pool in the summer with my kids. Um, you know, the bottom line is that oh, I've, I've missed the human connection, right? I, I've missed what that, what that is like and how it fuels me um, and the kind of energy that it creates. And I think that it, um, for, for many of us, has uh, created not only a, a physical distancing, but this greater sense of being alone, this greater sense of isolation. Um, I don't know, some of you know me, some of you don't, um, but one of the things you may not know about me is that I do things alone. And I, when I say I do things alone, like I, I mean I do things alone. For the last 10 years, um, I, I just, I've done everything by myself. Um, I never have a plus one. I never get picked up at the airport. I never have somebody with me at the neighborhood get together. Um, I just, you know, it's me and my kids and, and, and I do it alone. And I will tell you, um, also really honestly, for, um, for a, a long time, quite a while, um, I kind of carried a, a, a little bit of sense of shame about that isolation and kind of about that being the one who's doing it alone. Um, about six, seven years ago, I decided to really lean into that feeling. And you know, we, we all have heard about what it means to lean into something, um, but I really leaned into this. So uh, for me, that meant I was feeling alone so I thought I should spend more time alone, right? It sounds kind of counterintuitive, but it's, it's exactly what I did in a lot of ways. It's exactly what made this huge shift for me. So I did that by deciding to travel alone. And um, rather than it kind of being thrust on me, I chose it. So I started doing solo hiking trips every summer. I started um, adding extra days onto um, the, the work trips that I was already taking to make sure that I could explore and I could travel. Sometimes I just pick a place on the map and I just go. Um, and I'll tell you what all of this has done is it has empowered me and it has taken a sense of isolation and it has turned it into a strength. And I also have used these experiences to, I, I think, kind of cultivate like this traveler's mindset, right? And it's this traveler's mindset that I really want to talk about today. It's, it's the thing that I bring into the classroom in so many ways. Um, being strong on my own and learning how to travel and seeing the beauty of that experience has caused me to want to have those experiences in my classroom too, right? To take that traveler's mindset there. You know, we are oftentimes so conditioned within our systems to predict the learning, you know, our, but our best intentions oftentimes 
preclude the learning because we don't want the mess, right? We're wired for efficiency. We want the prepackaged thing. We want the thing that has the tied up with a pretty bow at the end, the thing that we can point to and be really certain about. That's like living in a space, but not really traveling in it. So when I'm living in a space, right? Well, I'm at home, right in my hometown. I'm telling you, I want efficiency. I know all of the shortcuts. I do not have to think about where I'm going, um, which also oftentimes helps me do many things at once. Um, I am on automatic pilot and I want everything to stay the same so that I can stay efficient. It's just kind of like living in the space, right? Wanting to get from one place to another as fast and as clearly as I can. And there have been times when I've been like that in my classroom too, right? Um, when I've just wanted to get from one place to the next as fast as I possibly can. But I think that precludes the beauty of learning, right? It precludes the beauty of the mess. So when I start to get in those spaces, I think back to what it means to be a traveler. Because when I'm a traveler, um, I take on a different sensibility. I'm slower, I pay closer attention, um, I enjoy the little things, I plan more carefully, and sometimes I don't plan at all. And when I do these things in my classroom, right, when I think about my classroom, when I go into it with wonder and wanting to have an experience and to give an experience, I find that, that the isolation dissipates. Um, and every once in a while, I have to be jolted, right, back into this mindset. I've been thinking a lot lately about a student I had um, quite a few years ago. His name was Robert. And the way that he jolted me out of what I thought I knew, he jolted me out of efficiency, right? So um, Robert, I had him his senior year, the last semester of his senior year. He needed to pass my English course in order to graduate. He was living with a really wonderful, supportive foster family. His foster father in particular was really involved um, at the beginning of the semester. Um, his, his foster father would bring him into school early a couple of times a week because he did need more encouragement and he had some catching up to do. Um, and so we would work together in the mornings and uh, we got him on a track, right? We got him on this, this path where he's, he's doing the work, he's catching up, he's staying focused, he's going to graduate, right? And, and we're excited. About four or five weeks before the end of the semester, like everything just falls apart. Like he just refuses to do anything. And um, so I have this conversation with him this one day. I said, Robert, what, why is this happening? Um, you know, don't you understand that you could be the first person in your family to graduate from high school? Do you understand like the world is gonna open up to you? And he said, he looked right at me and he said, well, you don't understand. And I said, well, tell me, what do I not understand? He said, my dad's in jail. My mom's been in jail and I can't live with her anymore. I have a brother and I can't live with him either. He said, my family does not understand this life you're asking me to live. So when you ask me to graduate from high school, you are asking me to walk away from my family. And I am scared to do that because even though I know this is good for me, they are my family and I love them and I still want them in my life and I am afraid of this path. And you know, I, I'll tell you, if, if you asked me to write down the hundred things I thought Robert might tell me in that conversation, that was not on the list, right? And it should have been on the list. And he made me understand his reality in a completely different way. I had been on automatic pilot. I had been thinking, how do I efficiently, you know, get you through this course? How do I efficiently get you to graduation? 
um, without taking into consideration everything else that was a part of this experience for him. So he called his foster father, who again, like really helped him learn to manage his fear and they came up with a plan and, and you know, and he pulled it together and he graduated and, um, you know, and his, his world did open up. So here's the thing that happens when we are travelers in our own spaces. You want to share your experience with others, right? When we are travelers and we are having experiences, we want to, we want to share what we've learned. We want to share how we've laughed. We want to share how we've cried. You know, I don't really want to take pictures um, from my car ride to my house to the grocery store. Um, but I do want to tell people the story of this cute little place that I found in Taos, New Mexico with like the best guacamole ever. And I pretty sure it tasted better because I was sitting on this kind of like secluded, cute little patio um, and I could smell the air. Travelers come back with stories and pictures and insights and memories. Travelers tell their stories. They tell their student stories. They tell their learner stories. They tell stories. And here is the thing about the storytelling. When we are doing this, we are using our voices. And that's what's going to make us feel less alone. And it is going to give us purpose. It is going to help us teach others. So be a traveler. Be an experience haver. Be the kind of teacher who is willing to be jolted out of your efficiency. Be the kind of teacher who brings purpose and wonder and experience to learning. Take care, everybody.